Okay, uh, welcome back for this uh, second session of the day that uh, uh, I will share with uh, Stefan uh, Compan. Uh, um, the topic of this session uh, is the control of Xylella fastidiosa. Uh, we have six presentation uh, dealing with the different uh, topics from the resistance in plants, in host plants, uh, to uh, different uh, innovative approach to control uh, the bacterium. Um, uh, I, I think I can invite uh, uh, the, the first speaker uh, uh, who doesn't need the presentation, Giuseppe Stancanelli, who will um, uh, give a presentation on the host plants and uh, all the work that EFSA uh, is doing for the host database. Thank you, Giuseppe. Thank you very much. So uh, I will talk today about how many plant species can Xylella fastidiosa infect. This is a work done mostly by Alice Del Bianco in, uh, in EFSA plant unit, then in collaboration with colleagues and uh, other institutions. Uh, so I think the first, we, we all remember from the first slide, we also seen it. The first detection was in 2013 in Apulia uh, of uh, Xylella fastidiosa in uh, olive orchard and very rapidly in um, the colleagues from the CNR uh, has uh, found out what was the cause of this uh, disease. And EFSA started to work on this, uh, on this pathogen with an urgent advice to the European Commission uh, in November 2013, and there we used the list of the host plants of the University of Berkeley, which was 132 host plant species. Uh, in 2015, we conclude the full risk assessment for Xylella, and we compile the first list of plant species. And then uh, we keep working on this database, and we arrive to a list of 312 plant species. And uh, in 2016, way after, this became 359. And then the colleague from the commission found useful to have a list uh, um, uh, to support the member state surveillance, to support the stakeholders, the farmers, a list about the host plant species of Xylella and the different subspecies strain isolates. So I asked EFSA to work on this and to include also more details, so whether the infection was natural or uh, artificial. Uh, consider natural infection is a bit more similar to the condition in our farms. And also information about tolerance or resistance of plant genotypes. And then we work on this in 2018, 2020. And recently we do two updates per year. So uh, we did five updates of the database recently. And the next one will be in January 2024. How we work on this, we do an extensive literature search, we screen the literature, we extract the data, we analyze the data. And particularly when we focus on the data extraction, we try to have a full reference database, so publication year, starting year of the study, uh, a clear botanical identification of the host plants, which is not always easy, from the, from all, not from all the published paper the infection method, the geographic information when available. They were particularly careful, so we only report the coordinates which are present in the paper. If not, we report the, just the name of the location. And then the description of the species, species, strain, ST type, identification method, and then uh, when is the relevant host status, tolerance and resistance. And everything is analyzed to try to uh, give a bit of a taste of the reliability of the paper by looking at which kind of detection method we're using the paper. So we have a very high number of host plants recorded with any detection methods and a lower number with uh, at least two reliable detection methods. But doesn't mean that the lower category uh, host plants are, uh, are not real. So uh, because we have very old paper where they study very seriously the host plants, but they use less, uh, less methods. Uh, every update uh, of the database is publicly available, so you can find a report on the EFSA journal analyzing the data. You can find the Excel file with all the data in the Zenodo platform, which is open access, and you also can find uh, interactive reports in uh, MicroStrategy uh, database platform of EFSA. Only for the MicroStrategy you need to request uh, a, a password for entry and the rest is, uh, is still open access, but uh, uh, you need to request the password. So uh, just looking at the results, so uh, analyzing 
4,600 reference uh, and extracting 13,000 records from this reference in the time span from 1930 till uh, last year. We can see that there are some peaks of record of uh, uh, new uh, uh, new plants oxylella. This peak correspond either to advance in the detection methods uh, like genome sequencing in the year 2000 or to new outbreaks. Unfortunately, whenever there is a new outbreak, you start to study in a new area and you find uh, a new host. If we think about the total number, uh, this is growing because of the more studies are done. And we have now on the lower category with any detection methods, but still a reliable paper, uh, 690 species from 88 different botanical families and 306 genera. And for the uh, most strict category, where we have at least two uh, detection methods, two modern detection methods, we have 433 species, 68 botanical families, 197 genera. So uh, I would say that I'm not sure we find another example of such a polyphagous uh, pathogen. Uh, please correct me in the question and answer later. <laughs> uh, if we look about the new host plants, so in the last two and a half years, the last five updates, uh, out of uh, 772 reference screened, we have 113 new host plants identified. And uh, uh, around one quarter of these uh, uh, 113 plants are uh, described from natural infection in the field and three quarters, sorry, from artificial infection in the field and three quarters from natural infection. Uh, and if you look at the country where uh, this report on new plants uh, uh, are, um, are reported, these are mostly the countries of new introduction in the EU, now mostly uh, France, Spain, and Portugal, less in Italy, because probably a lot of new host plants were already identified in the previous period, since 2013. And then we also have a consistent number of new um, identification of host plants from the area where uh, the pathogen uh, was already present by a long time. And I think this can be explained by the fact that uh, often you have new combination of vectors, new agro ecosystem, uh, new crops attacked, uh, like the olive, for example, in, in Brazil. And there uh, you, uh, you look at the natural vegetation, the weeds, and you find also new host plants. Uh, generally, most of the new records in the last year and a half are from Europe on the, from the multiplex subspecies, but also, also from Fastidiosa, Pauca, or uh, uh, we have an unknown category, which is always a bit fluctuating in the database because every time we have a report that uh, with an unknown subspecies, we uh, report as it is, but then we update if there is new information on subspecies or ST type or, or that report. So this, the last column is a bit uh, moving with time. If we think about the plants and the botanical families, uh, I would say most of the recent record are uh, from the traditional host family, Fabace, Asterace, Lamiace, Rosace also. But we also have a consistent number of records from trees. So we have high number from Juglandase, Fagase, Salicase, Vitase. So, uh, and going on. Uh, there were some records initially of Xylella and Coniferus uh, from uh, the Americas, but in fact was never uh, later confirmed and probably was done by uh, local infections with many, many vectors. Uh, in the recent work, there were also uh, new sequence type identified on, the, on this record of host plants, so ST88, ST89, in France uh, for the subspecies multiplex. And we also record in the database Xylella taiwanensis, but so far there we have easy life because there's only one host, which is Pyrus uh, pyrifolia. So if you want to know more about Xylella taiwanensis, there is a poster from Chen Yan Chi from USDRs, uh, the poster 49 in the, uh, in the poster room. Hmm. So concluding this short talk, I hope I respect my time. 
Every time there is a new outbreak of Xylella, we identify new host plants, and this is uh, either whether we have a, a new outbreak in a new area, like Portugal, for example, recently, or a new outbreak in a new crop, in a new uh, agroecosystem. Uh, the global database of Xylella host plants of EFSA uh, is a tool to support the risk manager and the, the um, local authorities, but it's also a useful tool for researchers, for risk assessors, and for the stakeholder, like a uh, farmer or nursery organization can look at uh, which plants, for example, uh, not to plant in that area. Uh, we do uh, now a regular update every six months, uh, normally published in January 2023, when uh, so far we have respect all the line, normally January and, uh, and June. Uh, we also think that this aspect, the uh, host plant database, like all the other aspects of Xylella, need to be uh, communicated to the public. We have seen uh, yesterday the movie, the documentary movie, the Aero Giants, uh, we've seen today, we'll see today uh, some short movie from the uh, research project. I think it's very important, whatever we do, we communicate clearly, easily uh, for the public to read so that mm, our result is not only for the, uh, uh, for the specialist. And for this reason, I'm showing you now something which is a bit outside of the topic. And uh, uh, together with colleagues in EFSA, we've done recently uh, some comic on Xylella to explain to the broad public. You can find on the EFSA website. Actually, it starts from the history in US. It go to the uh, arrival in Europe, in Apulia, uh, in Balearic Island, and then uh, the work of science to solve the problem. Uh, you may recognize some of the character with some difficulty because they're a bit stylized, but some of the characters in this uh, comic. So please have a look on our website. Uh, we also start in EFSA a campaign, a new uh, plant health awareness campaign together with the commission. There are video, uh, poster, documents, uh, and the message is all focused on, uh, at the moment, on general public awareness and on travelers. So uh, please. Have a look and uh, enjoy uh, also this, uh, to look at this communication activity. Thank you. Thank you, Giuseppe. And now is the turn of Nancy Herr from University of California, Riverside. She will present uh, a work on uh, priming uh, grape vines uh, to, uh, for immune response to Pierce disease. Um, Nancy is also, has been also uh, granted with uh, the EFSA research initiative. Welcome, everyone. I'd like to share how priming grape vines with lipopolysaccharide confers systemic resistance to Pierce's disease and identifies a peroxidase linked to defense priming. So Pierce's disease of grape vines is caused by Xylella fastidiosa. Some of, some of the external symptoms you may see is leaf scorching, which is marginal necrosis of the leaf, matchstick petioles, which is the abscission at the joint of the petiole and the leaf. And you can also have internal symptoms such as tylosis which are these balloon-like structures extruding into the xylem vesicles. And this is typically a plant defense response by the plant. And typically the more tylosis correlates to, oh, what's going on? Typically the more tylosis correlates to more disease severity. So LPS, interestingly, is an, it's identified as an important virulence factor it is also a known PAM, so a pathogen associated molecular pattern. So the hypothesis here is that LPS can trigger grapevine immunity through a defense priming mechanism. So the goal here is to mine global transcriptomic data of, of native grapevine genes that is related to xylella defense. So in plant defense priming, priming is an adaptive strategy that improves the defense capabilities of a plant against abiotic and biotic factors. And it is induced by priming stimulus such as LPS, so lipopolysaccharides, flag 22 and other factors which allows the plant to reprogram itself. Upon subsequent challenge with a pathogen such as Xylella, the plant is more regularly um, recognizes the pathogen and activates a strong immune response against it leading to 
resistance or tolerance. So this mechanism is, uh, exploits the plant memory and allows the plant to readily uh, better defend itself against abiotic and biotic challenges presented by a fluctuating environment. So some of the molecular mechanisms implicated by biotic stresses um, is the accumulation of PRRs, PR proteins, MAPKs, as well as chromatin modification and epigenetic changes. So our focus within this project is, the, uh, is within the post-challenge prime state, as you can see denoted in the green box, with our primary stimulus as LPS and our challenge as Lilella. So to study that, we primed our plants with lipopolysaccharides and ch pathogen challenged it with Lilella in our primed and pathogen challenged vines, as you can see in the first column. In the second column, with the naive and pathogen challenged vines, it is naive because it has not been primed with LPS, instead inoculated with water, and then with a pathogen challenge of Lilella later on. In your primed and mock challenge, you are primed with LPS and in mock challenge with PBS. And in your mock primed and mock challenge, you are mock primed with water and in mock challenge with PBS. So these two, the prime mock challenge and the prime mock and mock challenge are necessary controls and important for um, normalizing the data of the prime and pathogen challenge and the naive and pathogen challenge plants. And in order to understand the primary activities, we looked at the local petioles, the mark by the lower asterisk. And, and we looked at the systemic petioles, which is 1.5 meters apart or 20 nodes apart. As you can see, the mark by the asterisk on the top. So with pretreatment with um, LPS and grapevines, we did see a reduction of PD symptoms and Zylella titer. As you can see in the red box, the prime challenge plants have better symptoms compared to the naive challenge plants, whereas the prime mock and the mock mock plants are better off. You can see in a disease progression curve that the prime challenge have lower or a slower progression compared to the naive challenge. The, in the amount of titer, the prime challenge have a lower titer compared to the naive challenge. And if you look at the prime challenge uh, image of the tyloses, there are less tyloses compared to the naive challenge. And that is further reinforced by the tyloses included, vesicles, the percentage of it is much lower in the prime challenge plants compared to the naive challenge plants. So we were interested in if there was any transcriptional reprogramming in the plants, and indeed, priming with LPS does cause significant transcriptional reprogramming in the LPS prime vines. It was revealed that there was some pattern in the transcriptional reprogramming and that in the local petioles, you can see in the naive plants, there is a decrease of DEGs throughout time, whereas the, the prime plants, you see a steady expression of DEGs. In the systemic petioles, you can see that in the naive plants, there's a decrease of the EGs throughout time, as you see similarly in the systemic petioles. And in the prime plants, you can see an increase of the EGs. If you look down to the Venn diagram, you can see that in the prime plants in both local and systemic, that there are more DEGs compared to the naive. So this data does show a spatially synchronous response to the Zylella challenge in prime vines, but not in naive plants. So we discovered that LPS priming does elicit a synchronous systemic response to pathogen challenge. As you can see in a primed uh, plant that at four hours post inoculation, there's an increase of the number of endotrin DEGs and it increases from 24 hours post inoculation to 48 hours post inoculation, whereas there is a decrease, as you can see in the naive plants where you start high in the level of number of DEGs for four hours post inoculation, but decreases all the way to four to eight hours post inoculation. So this does show that in LPS prime vines that there is an increase of synchronous DEGs throughout time, whereas a decrease in naive plants. So this does show that LPS prime vines do have a spatially synchronized response from the local all the way to 1.5 meters or 20 nodes above to the systemic pedio in response to the pathogen throughout time and it's reinforced throughout time as well. And furthermore, we were interested in the co-expressed genes shared among the same time points, and we found that six more overlapping modules were shared between the prime and local systemic networks at the same time point, compared to the three less in the naive. So with that, we're interested in what DEGs are among the pre and post pathogen challenge in LPS prime vines, and in LPS only treated vines and LPS treated with uh, as well with a Zylella pathogen, we found over 3,000 upregulated DEGs shared between the two scenarios. So we were interested in looking at the mechanisms um, uh, activated among genes by only the 
LPS, and we found 24 genes of interest, one of which, which was peroxidase BV ICP1 gene. This gene was highly upregulated in the pre and post pathogen challenge in LPS prime vines. And in a previous study, it was shown to be significantly upregulated as well. So uh, we quantitatively expressed VV ICP1 into vines, and it did show uh, PD resistance. As you can see, uh, the area under the disease progression curve that the VV ICP1 plant showed a lower um, disease progression compared to Thompson seedless. So it reduced the disease progression in VV ICP1. There are fewer tyloses in VV ICP1 compared to Thompson seedless, whereas the titer is relatively the same for both. So this suggests that there's that the modulation of an oxidative environment is important for PD resistance, as well as delaying the tylosis development which is linked to Pierce's disease resistance. So overall, LPS is seen as, a, as acting as a role in priming stimulus in vitis manifera. Prime, defense priming with LPS results in significant reduction of disease. Our gene of interest, BVICP1, uh, its overexpression confers PV resistance and is also associated with a decrease in tylosis production. And this suggests that a modulation of the oxidative environment is important during the Lyella infection process. Overall, I'd like to thank everyone who worked on this paper, and I would like to thank um, the committee for allowing me to present in, for today, and I'd like to thank everyone for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Anansi. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Pasquale, I think you know him. <laughs> The floor is yours. Merci. Uh, uh, thanks to the organizer for inviting, uh, for inviting me to give this speech. Uh, this is the first slide that is full of uh, logos and people. Uh, it's not my habit, but in this, the, in the in the speech that I am going to present, there are many actors which belongs to different institutions, uh, genetician, also people in the fields, and also farmers. And also it's a, a, a synopsis, a synthesis of, uh, of all the knowledge that we have accumulated in different projects, uh, BioVex or RESIX or BioSAVEX, either from the European Commission or uh, our uh, regional, uh, regional authorities. And I'm, I'm going to this speech to uh, report about the research, the search of spontaneous seedling, seedlings surviving to the infection in the uh, very uh, early area of the epidemic that you find here in, in this map. These uh, seedlings, spontaneous seedlings, they were selected in olive groves in uncultivated areas uh, close to the Mediterranean Machis, or were also rootstock of dead trees. Uh, and they were selected and observed in the time frame of uh, six years, more or less, uh, uh, about the, the, the xylella population size, so the amount of, uh, of the bacterium in the plants, uh, and also the presence of symptoms uh, on a scale of one to five, which, uh, which uh, of course, was uh, low in these uh, um, seedlings. Uh, we started to collaborate with geneticians and we did uh, uh, a single sequence repeat paternity analysis on, on, uh, on a number of 139 genotypes, uh, of which we were able to identify the two parents uh, of 95 of them uh, and, uh, and one parent of 41 of them. Only on three of them we, we were not able to identify any, any, any parents from this. Uh, we um, constructed uh, an abujorin trees uh, uh, of the, uh, based on the assessor analysis and based on the distinction of these uh, seedlings according to, uh, to the scale that I described uh, um, before. Uh, where they were described as highly susceptible, susceptible, tolerant, resistant, or highly resistant based on the two parameters that I mentioned before. We constructed these neighbor-joring trees, uh, uh, including also known cultivars, uh, the, the, the profile of known cultivars, but we were not able to correlate the, 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 the phenotype with uh, uh, a particular profile of SSR. 
it seems that there are uh, uh, two, uh, two uh, SSR that correlate with, uh, with the susceptible, uh, susceptible seedlings, but we, we, we need to, um, to, to, to go in depth on this. Uh, we, um, we, we observed with this analysis that they cluster with Italian cultivars. Uh, this parentage analysis gives also an overview of which are the most frequent, frequently identified uh, parents in these op open pollinated seedlings. And that uh, uh, you can imagine they are the, the two main uh, susceptible um, cultivars of olives cultivated in the area, which are Oliarola salentina and Cellina di Nardò. I remember you, these are the susceptible cultivars and uh, Lecino, which is also uh, um, widespread, uh, uh, mainly cultivated in the area. Uh, and then uh, from this analysis, we uh, evaluated uh, um, the, the, the crosses of each one of the three uh, uh, more present, uh, more frequently detected uh, um, cultivars uh, induce uh, 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 um, contribute to the observed phenotypes. What we observed that is that uh, when Lecino is a parent of this cross, we got the 67% of the highly resistant, resistant uh, and tolerant cultivars. While uh, this is not true with uh, uh, when uh, uh, one of the two susceptible cultivars, Cellina di Nardò and Oliarola Salentina, uh, was, uh, was, uh, was uh, apparent. So crosses with the Lecino gave more frequent uh, resistant cultivars. Um, Lecino, as I said before, with all, when contributed with all the, um, the, the, the cultivars, uh, uh, show, as I showed before, uh, induced the 70% the, the of resistance. And uh, uh, the, the, geno the genotypes of Lecino this is uh, the interaction, the contribute of Lecino to the, uh, to, the, to, the, to the genotypes, to the phenotype observed. So when Lecino was uh, crossed with all the cultivars, you got, uh, we, we observed uh, a, a, very, a very high uh, percentage of, uh, of uh, resistant or tolerant cultivars. But when Lecino was uh, uh, crossed with the two susceptible cultivars, Cellina di Nardò and Oliarola Salentina, you can see we have a, a lower, a decrease uh, of the contribution of Lecino to the induction of resistance of tolerance. And when Lecino is crossed with Oliarola, which is the highly susceptible cultivars, you, uh, you, you, we observe the, the opposite. So Lecino was not, not able to contrast the, the, the susceptibility, I would say, of the, of, uh, of, uh, of the oliarola or the highly susceptible cultivars. Uh, we selected three outperforming genotypes uh, that, uh, that were crossed across, of course, of Lecino with Cipressino le or Lecino with oliarola. They were based, uh, this selection uh, was based on low bacteria population, poor and erratic colonization, and very limited symptoms. And for now, I, I'm going to present a very preliminary gene expression analysis between these uh, different sectors of the plants. Uh, uh, because it's mm, uh, the, the uh, sector of the plants which was xylella positive or tissues which, which were uh, xylella ne negative. We are also performing a gene expression of, uh, of, uh, of the propagated, uh, of, uh, of these propagated three outperforming genotypes, but this is a study which is ongoing. But here you have a, a, a results of, uh, of a first year post-inoculation of one of these uh, three outperforming genotypes uh, uh, in, in, uh, inoculated, artificially inoculated uh, with, uh, with xylella. And here you have the two control, Cellina di Nardò, one year later is desiccated, and also uh, and the control Lecino, which is resistant. Uh, these three outperforming genotypes, the gene expression analysis, uh, allows to distinguish the different sector of the plants, uh, the xylella positive and xylella negative. Uh, and among the top loading genes that we are observing, there are some, the, the increase of uh, a couple of so-called susceptibility genes, genes that enhance uh, 
the, 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 uh, the susceptibility of the plants which control the, uh, the harmonic acid levels and the sugar transport protein. We also observed some uh, uh, of the genes that we already observed in previous uh, gene expression analysis which has related to the uh, cell wall response of the plants uh, like uh, receptor like kinase, wall associated kinase and also we observed a, a different uh, a complex different response among the three, uh, the three genotypes. Uh, two of them uh, uh, were, uh, in two of them we observed a very a decrease of the of the of the um, um, photosynthesis, uh, mainly these are genes related to the photosystem two. While uh, in in another, in, uh, it, it was an also an in, it was in two of them an increase on another susceptibility genes, which is, is this downy mildew resistance like genes. It's a no, known susceptibility genes, which has been also engineered in grape, for example. So our conclusion is that seedlings uh, that we collected uh, are mainly from the main cultivars in the area. We do not find uh, uh, a correlation bet uh, uh, between the olive response to xylella fastidiosa and the SSR profiles. The crosses of these seedlings with lecino gave more frequent, uh, highly resistant, resistance and tolerant uh, uh, genotype, uh, phenotypes. Three outperforming genotypes uh, have been selected and they are the subject of, uh, of, uh, of more studies and also propagation. Uh, there, is a, uh, th there were the differential expressed genes in ident identified and also there is a multiple defense response which is very complex and is different in the three genotypes. This is for us, uh, I was happy when I had the, the results of this first SSR analysis be because it's a confirmation of previous findings uh, and uh, uh, that we also observed, uh, for example, in this, uh, in this two paper, one related to the physiological response of, uh, xyl of, uh, of uh, uh, lecino, which is more resilient to the draw stress induced by xylella fastidiosa, and uh, another uh, paper that we published in, in 2022 in which we observed that lecino entraps in such a way the cells of uh, uh, xylella fastidiosa in a sort of uh, uh, callous-like uh, uh, environment. And this is all. Thank you. I hope we don't go to this Olivier at the end. Thank you, Pasquale. We, we have now time for the question and answer session. If there are uh, some questions. Uh, please, uh, when you uh, uh, raise a question, uh, uh, briefly present yourself uh, just uh, uh, to know who is in the question and uh, stand up because from here it's uh, dif difficult to see who is uh, uh, making the question. Uh, this is for Afer for the Omelif Squatch. Um, I'm curious, that's my curiosity, is uh, the omelette squash is found in Israel and is a uh, subspecies, Fastidiosa, am I correct? Yes. But ha have you found the subspecies multiplex? Be the reason I ask for that is because in California you can find both subspecies quite easily. Uh, so no, so far we haven't found multiplex in Israel, uh, in almonds or in any other crop only fastidiosa. It appears that there's been, an, uh, I mean, that's our hypothesis, a single introduction of the bacterium to Israel. And so, so far we don't find any other subspecies. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Philippe, LMU uh, postdoc in Germany. Uh, I have two questions for Louise and one for uh, Renata. Uh, Louise, uh, your peptides, I, maybe I missed it, but uh, are they uh, engineered specifically to interact with particular targets on the bacterial side, or are they isolated from libraries of, of already known uh, peptides? Is, 
This is actually the final aim to try to design the peptides to be more targeted towards a specific targets. But uh, at the moment, the peptides that uh, I presented in this work, they generally were found in the nature and then they were, for example, uh, designed or they are short fragments of secropin and melatine. Uh, they have been combined between different natural finding peptides. S uh, usually the mechanism of action uh, when it comes to antibacterial activity usually uh, is due to the uh, charge of the peptide which interacts with the membrane and causes the disruption. But uh, we found out that some peptides can have multiple activities, such as BP100, which uh, we saw that affecting motility. And the in silico experiments so far seem to be that they interact within a specific region of an adenosine of chilella, which might be the reason why there is the decrease in, um, in motility that we observe. And uh, we are talking about peptides of what, which size, more or less? Usually uh, they range, the smallest one that I presented today was seven amino acids, and uh, the longest one, well, maybe 178, it's quite big, but the other ones are the maximum 14, 14 amino acids. Okay, thank you. And uh, for Renata? Uh, so uh, I have the, the feeling that um, if, if this technique has been used before to cure uh, grapevines in diseases in uh, Europe. Uh, I would like you to comment on why do you think it took so long to try it in the United States? As far as I understand, uh, the, the grapevine disease there has been quite severe for a very long time. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very good question. And this is because of the, 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 the regulatory process for using bioengineered rootstocks. And uh, before being able to have the permit to plant the grapes in the field and be able to uh, analyze and infect, we had to first test in the lab and confirm uh, the activity of the, the proteins. And then we have to move to the greenhouse and do greenhouse testing and disease scoring in the greenhouse. And only after that, we were able to apply for the permit. And also to maintain the permit, we need to send regularly reports to them. So that's why it's taking so long because of the regulatory process for commercialization. So, so it's mostly about the genetic engineering part? It's about the genetic engineering okay. part. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Hi, good morning. I'm Valeria Scala, and I have a um, question for uh, Nancy Herr and Pasquale Sardarelli. According to your results, you highlighted that uh, two different genes that uh, are um, um, present in the pathway, one deoxygenase and one peroxidase, are activated in the response of oxylella in two different plants. Do you have some hypothesis uh, regarding the role of these genes uh, in the plant pathogen interaction and the physiology of uh, disease? I'm not quite sure where you got two genes from, but the gene VVICP1 gene is a peroxidase, and our hypothesis on that, which is just a hypothesis right now, is that it's important in the priming defense of a plant, and that it may link the post-pathogen challenge priming phase with the priming state that you saw earlier in my slide about um, the plant priming defense. And what was the other part to your question as well? No, it's the one for regarding your peroxidase mm -hmm. that you know is uh, really known the role in plant pathogen interaction and defense also in the priming because it's uh, the pathway of uh, important steps for uh, the activation of a plant response. And the other one, because the similar is uh, for uh, the other from Pasquale, your gene your gene peroxidase and also the deoxygenase that Pasquale highlighted are the same, not the same, but a similar role in the plant physiology and the response to the pathogen. So is my question is regarding if you have a hypothesis on the role in the physiology after priming or for defense to xylella, also for peroxidase mm -hmm. and the deoxygenase. Um, for the peroxidase, um, we saw that when it was 
expressed early within the grapevine that there was less tylosis seen. And because of that, we also saw that there was less disease severity. Um, in terms of the other presentation, I'm not quite familiar or don't quite remember what you are trying to um, trying to like ask for. So I'm sorry about that. Okay, don't worry. I'm Pasquale. Uh, the, uh, we, we are far from identifying a single genes of uh, of, uh, of uh, responding to the to the to the infection uh, to of, of xylella in olives. Regarding the two oxygenes that I mentioned, the one uh, controls uh, the the yasmonic um, acid levels, and the other the the uh, um, acetyl acetylic uh, uh, acid uh, level. Two uh, hormones that are related to plant immunity, as you know, in uh, in uh, in um, in, uh, in plants. In other systems, uh, for example, DMR6, uh, downy mildew resistance like 6, uh, has been uh, knocked down uh, in grave, uh, has, has been knocked down, and there are grave ones, uh, for example, uh, uh, produced in Italy that has been uh, knocked out for this DMR6 genes and also in Arabidopsis, if, if, uh, if I am correct, if I remember well, the knocking, uh, knocking down this gene uh, induce resistance. So it's a classical plant immunity uh, uh, system related, uh, response gene related to plant immunity. So this is a general. The other genes that we normally observe that are related to the uh, apoplast interaction of the xylella with the cell wall. And then uh, we have uh, already mentioned in other paper wall associated kinase or resistance like kinase. So these are uh, these are the general response. Okay. If I can uh, uh, answer to the colleague from Germany, there were in Europe uh, uh, in the past grave and transgenic. They were for viruses, for uh, grave and family viruses, but they were uprooted. It was in the past OGM period <laughs> in Colmar. <laughs> okay. Hi there, uh, Aaron Hoyle from uh, the UK Risk Manager. Um, this is for Nancy. Um, it's just about your LPS. Um, when do you think would be the best time to apply that in, in a field situation in the future? Because uh, if it was exactly when you got xylella, that'd obviously be quite difficult. Do you see it preventative or, or my neighbors got it? Or um, yeah, how would you see that working? Um, well, for me, I would think that putting LPS in the plant uh, before the xylella is introduced be the, will be the best because that's the whole point of priming is to get the plant ready for a pathogen attack. So with LPS from xylella, um, the pathogen, or no, the plant will, once you prime it with LPS, the plant will be, be more able to recognize the pathogen attack. So it will be before, so as a preventative, you would say. And how, how long would that priming last for, mm. do you know? Uh, we only tested up to 48 hours. I'm not quite sure past that, but within four hours, there was a response of up upregulation of the EGs. And then after that, there was a steady uh, flow of the EG expression at the local um, petiole. So that's what, where the point of inoculation is. Um, in terms of systemic, you, you saw in my um, talk that it decreases the number of DEGs, so I believe that after four hours you'll see some form of response. Um, so I think that'll be, like it's pretty early on, I believe, so. Uh, I'm Saskia Rukenhout, John in the Center, United Kingdom. Um, I also have a, a question for the last speaker. Uh, so, um, if you if the defense response is primed, don't you, do you think there might be a trade-off uh, of yields? Uh, because there are also, um, you know, defense-activated plants <laughs> that you can continuously 
have activated defense, and those are uh, often affected in uh, in yield uh, of fruit fruit yields. Um, are you asking about how if a plant were to be um, primed, that that might um, bring down the yield of a yeah. of a vine? Yeah. Uh, so that's an interesting question. Uh, for our lab, we work with the vine only. When there are fruit, we do cut it down because uh, we don't look into the fruit. But yeah, to send the resources of a plant to um, defense priming, so to get the plant ready for defense, may um, not allow it to focus on fruit. So it may not allow for a higher yield. But I believe that if you do prime your plant first, and if it is able to live, that um, it will allow you to have yield compared to the other side. If you were to um, be colonized by Lella, it may lose more fruit yield compared to if it were to be LPS primed. So overall, uh, it may detract from the fruit yield, but I feel like it will be uh, better to prime your plant. Uh, that's just speculation though, so yeah. yeah. But we are interested in field trials and looking at the fruit. So that will be in the future. So thank you for that question. Other questions? One question to Pasquale. So uh, you have two varieties which are resistant, uh, identify resistant uh, in Apulia, so Lecino and the Fabulo FS from Frantoio group, so it's a different lineage. Uh, do you see, a di is there a difference in the resistance or you think it's the same mechanism? Uh, from, uh, Sorry. from limited investigation that we have uh, in the greenhouse uh, from gene expression analysis with uh, FS17, it seems yes. So uh, it's a different uh, uh, mode of resistance, but we have not enough data on FS17. The, 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 but it seems it, it, it is different. Also, in the, if I remember well, uh, uh, in the physiological response that we uh, monitored uh, in, in the paper that I presented, the Surano et al., the last one, there is a difference between Lecino and FS17. Uh, you, you cannot... Uh, do a single, uh, single uh, uh, synopsis of, of, of the two. That's the truth for now. Other questions? Hello, uh, my name is Eduardo Moralejo from Mallorca, Traxa. I have a question for uh, Ophir. Yeah, it's about, um, you show um, the virality Loren, it was more resistant than the other ones. And when you monitor, monitor it, the tree for the second year, you found that the tree was, um, was healthy and you can detect the, by PCR, but it was very, very healthy compared to the other ones. Um, my question is, do you think this has to do with winter covering? Winter covering, I mean, um, uh, the plant has been exposed to, um, has been um, less infected and then in the winter has been exposed to l l temperatures and had more, more probabilities to be recovered. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, so uh, I think so. Um, so yes, winter recovery is much less documented in almonds than in grapevines, but uh, yeah, it's, I mean, at least in grapes, uh, grapevines, we know that when the infection is not uh, established well enough and the vine gets to the winter period, then in, it has higher chances of recovering from the infection. So basically what we saw here is what you just described, right? We see a lower, levels, lower level of the pathogen in this uh, variety. And so it hasn't established to high enough levels maybe to sustain the winter temperature and it could be uh, the mechanism why we don't see symptoms in the second year. But again, it's, it's an hypothesis at this stage. Thank you.
phone for IT came up with rock strips good enough to connect the silos. And that may explain the low cycles of Sayana in the, in the, in the grinding the water then bringing the system to the, the water itself. Um, yes, I guess that's a possibility that uh, we actually took into consideration. And one of the other parameters we were taking in addition to the symptoms of the disease and Zalela incidence is was looking at the viability of the graft. Yeah. And then in incidences where we have varieties, let's say with lower viability in the graft, then you could suggest that maybe, yeah, that the jointing was not, uh, is not good enough and then it doesn't support the growth. And then you can also say that maybe Zalela was not uh, transmitted because of that. But in this specific variety, we had very um, high rates of su uh, successful uh, graft and also the the viability and the vigor of the science was very was very high, so I don't suspect that there's some um, impairment there in the xylem connection that that prevented uh, the movement of xylella. I, ha I have one question for you also, Fir. Uh, did you check if there is a different of size of the xylem in the more tolerant cultivar compared to the susceptible? Uh, this is something we are looking at uh, right now and these days, so I don't have an answer yet. Thank you. No more questions? Excuse me? Yes, there is one. Yes, uh, a question for Ophir also. Uh, are you planning to inoculate uh, Xylella using vectors to those resistant or tolerant almond cultivar? Um, actually, we haven't planned on doing that, but it's a good idea. I think we should consider it definitely. No, this, this will sh uh, answer the question made by, by Saskia. Yeah, so we are doing, uh, doing pin-prick inoculation, so the, the standard inoculation method in, you know, in, a, in a greenhouse or quarantine facility. But it mm -hmm. would be good also to test with, uh, with the insect vector, indeed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My question is uh, for uh, Ophir. <laughs> so uh, uh, can you exclude that the, the, the graft uh, is uh, inoculated by vectors in the field? Or you control this? So um, No, we don't control this. But then if, even if it is inoculated by, by vectors, you would I mean, then expect even the disease to be even uh, more severe if you have infection from the graft and from the insect. But the thing is, in almond orchard in Israel, the, uh, we, we have never found an insect vector in an almond orchard. So the, um, the abundance of, of the possible vectors uh, in the almond orchard is very, very, very low. And we also noticed that, you know, I've presented this at other times, that the disease progressed very, very slowly in almonds in Israel. So even if there is some infection, it's it's in a very low rate. So we believe that it's mostly coming from the infected tree. Thank you very much for all these questions and also the speakers. We have now a short uh, movie about one project related to Xylella on uh, BioVexo. Just two, three minutes. The BioVexo project is one of a number of projects at an EU and national scale that is seeking to find a solution to the threat posed by Zyella. It launched in May 2020 with the aim of exploring innovative biopesticides targeting both the Zyella bacterium and its vector. It is coordinated by the AIT, the Austrian Institute of Technology, and RTDS Group. In total, the project has 11 partners from five EU countries. Besides managing the epidemic by controlling inoculum sources and vector populations, there is a compelling need to control the bacterium in planter. No recognised products have been shown to be efficient in targeting the bacterium in infected plants. Moreover, the availability of non-chemical products against the vector for use in organic production is extremely limited. Six candidate biocontrol solutions acting either against Zyella or its vector were selected for testing in both curative and preventative approaches. Following small-scale on-field validation and improved formulation, 
The BioVexo project has now focused its work on upscaling the production and further testing of the three best performing biopesticides, two plant extracts and a bacterial endophyte. Large scale on-field evaluation is being conducted, including both traditional and newly planted olive orchards in Apulia in Italy and Majorca and Alicante in Spain. Additional testing is being done on almond trees in Majorca. The ultimate aim is for the BioVexo project to support final product development to technology readiness level 7 and 8. The final products are intended to contribute towards reducing xylella pressure and disease severity in olive cultivation, protecting and securing long established olive orchards, preventing xylella infections and disease in new olive plantations, securing and sustaining jobs in disease affected areas, and ensuring continued olive and almond cultivation. The BioVexo project is currently in month 40 of its planned 60 month duration and is on track to conclude in April 2025. You can find out more on our project website, biovexo.eu, and can keep up to date by following us on social media. You may also find various representatives from BioVexo project partners here in Lyon, and we will have a sign up sheet for our newsletter circulating by our poster, Poster 50 in the poster session at lunch. Please come and meet us. Okay, so uh, I think we, we can close this session. Thank you for, uh, to the speakers for the presentation and for uh, the uh, numerous questions from the audience. I don't know if Giuseppe has some uh, uh, other announcement. Uh, no, for we uh, for lunch and for the the poster uh, session in the in the room in front of this uh, auditorium. Thank you. Thank you.